Good morning, everyone. Just last check to make sure you all can hear me. Yes, we hear you, Jessica. Great. Great. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to our webinar on WHO's early release guidelines on when to start ART and pre-exposure prophylaxis. We're delighted and uh, pleased to have a esteemed panel with us today, led by Dr. Meg Doherty, who's the head of maternal uh, newborn and child health at WHO, Dr. Shafiq Asaji, who leads PMTCT and MNCH at the HIV department of WHO, Dr. Martina Penizato, who's responsible for pediatrics, uh, Dr. Eleanor Namasuke Magongo from the Ministry of Health of Uganda, and Dr. Dominika Seidman from the University of California at San Francisco. We have a very thorough and um, full presentation and webinar today. Uh, just to provide a quick overview, we will, Meg Doherty will provide a historical picture of the WHO guidelines, and that will be followed by presentations that focus on when to start ART in pregnant women, in children and adolescents, with a example of implementation from Uganda. And then lastly, we will conclude with a presentation on pre-exposure prophylaxis, what do one say, and in particular, what does it, what do we know about pre-exposure prophylaxis for pregnant women? That's a quick overview of our webinar today. A few housekeeping issues. Kindly keep your phones, uh, your microphones on mute uh, so that there's very minimal static and interference. And um, please let us know if you're having any problems connecting by typing in, and we'll do our best to resolve them. And after the first few presentations that focus on when to start ART, we will have a Q&A session, and then we will have another separate Q&A session on uh, pre-exposure pro prophylaxis. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Meg Doherty to start us off with the webinar. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and thank you very much to the ITT to ha for having a WHO at this session. And it sounds like a very exciting lineup. I'm going to have to step out after this presentation, but uh, I'm, you're in great hands with our uh, technical folks here. So um, for this update of the WHO early release guidelines, it's, it's good to look backwards and to see where we have come since 2013. And as you are more than aware, there are very um, ambitious targets uh, globally now towards ending the AIDS epidemic by 2030 and the 90-90-90 targets that many of you are aware of. And to fulfill these targets, we need adoption and implementation of guidelines that are based on evidence um, to both increase the number of persons eligible and available to treat and also make sure that we have the best interventions to deliver persons and to keep them on therapy for the life, their lifetime. You may be aware that we put out in 2013 the first consolidated set of guidelines which contained 50 new and updated recommendations and for the first time it brought together clinical, operational and programmatic aspects as well as m &E aspects of treatment and care. And it for the first time also brought together separate documents that had been prepared for pregnant women and breastfeeding women and children, so bringing all populations together across the board. So since we launched that guideline back in uh, July of 2013, we had a fairly aggressive dissemination process and rollout process where we worked with WHO countries and regions as well as other partners and conducted nine dissemination meetings across our six regions serving 100 countries. And from that, we found that almost, well, nearly 70 to 80 percent of the countries took up the recommendation to increase uh, the threshold for initiation to 500, as well as we had a 
very nearly 90% uptake of option B+, which is particularly important for you today. Next slide. So this also shows the documentation that has come out since the guidelines with on the very far left, the consolidated guidelines, and then a number of other pieces of um, recommendations such as the skin and oral manifestations of HIV, guidance for HTC in adolescents, uh, guidance on um, uh, key populations, guidance on uh, hepatitis C and hepatitis B, as well as a very important technical document on viral load implementation and Q-Wave um, handbook for point of care testing. In December 2014, we put out a supplement to the guidelines that included recommendations, new recommendations on PEP and use of cotrimoxazole, again important for um, pregnant and breastfeeding women and children, as you'll be discussing today. Essentially making and liberating the use of uh, PEP and cotrimoxazole so that it's easier to use and simplified. Next slide. Many of you are aware our process um, for developing guidelines follows what we call the GRADE approach which is grading of recommendations, assessment, and development, and evaluation. And essentially, we look at both the quality of the evidence and the strength of the recommendations. So whenever you do look at one of our recommendations, you will see a statement followed by strength of the recommendation and quality. The quality of the evidence um, it goes along a grade, uh, so, uh, I don't know, a grade where we look at um, randomized controls trials at the highest quality, and it's really not related to how well the study is done, which sometimes our investigators get worried about. <laughs> and moderate to low quality really represents things uh, such as op um, observational studies or cross-sectional studies. Very low quality data usually represents data from, say, for example, ecological studies that are showing associations. The strength of the recommendation is generally based upon the feeling of the guideline development group, and it can be based on the quality of the evidence from a systematic review, a balance of the benefits and harms as perceived by the guideline group, as well as with that which is assessed from the values and preferences from the community and the end users cost and cost effectiveness and the feasibility of so it's not just only the evidence that moves that moves uh, strength from either um, uh, strong to conditional and a strong recommendation is is generally we would recommend that for everyone every place whereas a conditional it might be that it's right for some people at this at certain times so contextual next slide this just highlights our last guideline, which shows the elements of the clinical, operational, and programmatic guidance. And, and in the clinical, it, was, it really covers when to start, what to start, what to switch to, how to monitor, and comorbidities. In the operational, we had several recommendations about service delivery, integration, task shifting, and, and decentralization, as well as some in, uh, comments about drug supply and diagnostics. And lastly, we had how, a section on how to decide what to do first. So these sections will be further um, elaborated and further developed in our 2015 update. So let's get to the where we are now. So from over 2014 up until 2015, we did a number of scoping meetings, I think essentially seven or eight scoping meetings to better identify which are the PICO questions or the questions that we wanted to conduct um, conduct our systematic reviews. But what you'll see on this first slide are the clinical recommendations. We had a five-day meeting where we discussed when to start, what to start, and what to start during TB. Uh, what to use in first, second, and third lines, toxicity of the various regimens, PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis, infant prophylaxis and infant feeding in the light of having more uh, persons, uh, more pregnant women um, and breastfeeding women taking therapy, 
diagnostics in terms of early infant diagnosis, the uh, approach to early infant diagnosis, viral load, and point of care testing. And what is the role of CD4 in the future when we have viral load to monitor? Next slide. We also spent quite a bit of time looking at how to improve the care that people will be taking, which include the packages of care, testing, linkage interventions, improving the continuum in terms of retention, adherence, and in particular, we had a, a review on postpartum retention and retention for gender and issues related to men in particular. We had recommendations and discussions around how frequent P PLWA should come to clinic and, and pharmacy visits, further task shifting for both drug dispensing and or just distribution and task shifting for labs, much more on infant testing and pediatric testing settings. And as many of you know more about the work of double dividend, and I think uh, Shafiq may allude to some of that, but I think it will be supportive. Uh, adolescent friendly services, again, important to this group, and further service integration of HIV into STI and family planning and HIV and mental health and HIV and cardiovascular, as well as quality of care. Next. So in the last two slides, I'll just show you where we're at. Um, in IAS, we released a brief preview of the key recommendations, uh, which included um, a programmatic update and guide, which you can find on our uh, websites, which I identifies five <coughs> countries um, that have moved to treating all, and in particular, a case study from Uganda that has treated all children, which would be of interest to you. We have now launched not what we call our interim guideline, but we're calling it our early release guideline on September 30th, where you may have heard we are um, speaking of treating all, and you'll hear more about that today, and use of pre-exposure pro prophylaxis to prevent those at substantial risk of HIV. We plan to provide an update of the full integrated guideline or consolidated guideline on December 1 at ICASA. So, next slide. Today we will review when to start in pregnant and breastfeeding women, which were covered in the pre-release guideline, when to start ART in children and adolescents, and the pre-exposure guidance, um, prophylaxis guidance with a special note for pregnant women. So, good luck, enjoy your session this afternoon, and thank you very much. Um, I will defer all questions to my colleagues because I think this, there shouldn't really be too many on this. And if needed, uh, Jessica, we should certainly send out a link to where all of these materials can be found on the WHO website. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Meg Doherty, for giving us a sense of how the guidelines are developed and a preview of what will be addressed in the full guidelines to be released in December. Um, and we will certainly share links to uh, these presentations as well as uh, the guidelines themselves, the early release guidelines, which uh, we have as part of this webinar, and we'll send them out again. Um, our, I, I'll take any questions regarding uh, Meg's presentation at this point. But I think it was really meant to just set the stage for the webinar. Um, and we can move forward to the next presentation, which will be delivered by Dr. Shafiq Asaji, uh, who leads PMTCT and Maternal Newborn and Child Health at um, the HIV department in WHO. And he will discuss the guidelines that focus on when to start ART in pregnant and breastfeeding women. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so as, as Jess said, yes, we're going to talk next about when to start in pregnant and breastfeeding women. Um, and uh, uh, in essence, the new guidelines, uh, as you've seen in the early release guidelines, are now recommending universal ART for all pregnant and breastfeeding women. Uh, to quote specifically, what it says is ART should be initiated in all pregnant and breastfeeding women living with HIV 
regardless of clinical stage and at any CD4 cell count and continued lifelong. And this was a strong recommendation based on what was felt to be moderate quality of evidence. So I think what we're seeing here is a, is a transition from option A in 2010 and option B uh, in 2013. Option A was dropped and uh, we moved to op adding option B plus. So we had option B and B plus. Uh, and now we're moving from option B plus to recommending lifelong ART for everybody uh, and removing the option, as it were, uh, so that uh, the new guidelines will no longer speak of option B and, and, and the choices that programs have, but rather of universal antiretroviral treatment. And I think one thing that's very important for us to recognize here is that this recommendation, whilst it is very specific for pregnant and breastfeeding women, doesn't actually derive from the PMTCT literature. Rather, it's based on a couple of key studies that are uh, uh, in adults uh, that have really driven the guidance around recommending universal antiretroviral treatment for all. So in, in particular, what I want to discuss briefly is two uh, adult studies uh, that were both released at IAS in Vancouver and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and the first is Temprano, which is a multi-center randomized clinical trial which looked at uh, immediate uh, treatment versus WHO-guided treatment initiation uh, and also looked at uh, isoniazid preventive therapy versus no isoniazid preventive therapy. So there were effectively four arms, uh, one where people got WHO guided and no isoniazid prevented therapy, one where it was WHO guided ART but isoniazid preventive therapy for everybody, uh, and then there were two arms with immediate ART either with or without isoniazid preventive therapy. Uh, this was all done in Abidjan, in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, and it enrolled um, uh, uh, a number of uh, asymptomatic HIV-infected adults, all of whom had CD4 less than 800 at enrollment. And the important thing to remember with this is that the study took several years, and over time, definitions of WHO-guided ART actually changed. And so when we look at the data in a second, you'll see that I'm, I'm going to show you two uh, pieces of the data, one that relates to CD4 counts less than, uh, 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 less than um, I mean above 500, and one that relates to all patients. And so when considering the primary outcome, which is on the y-axis in these curves, uh, which was a combined primary outcome, that uh, looked at both death as well as severe uh, HIV disease. What you can see is that deferred treatment, especially without IPT, fared the worst of all. That's the light blue line on top. Um, but in all the combined statistical analysis that looked at all patients with early ART versus those with deferred ART, there was a significance in terms of the combined outcome, which was highly statistically uh, uh, important. And, and this was seen whether you looked at all of the patients taken together or just those that had a CD4 count of more than 500. I think the other very important piece of data, which is even more persuasive, was the START trial, which is a huge multi-country study that enrolled over 4,000 clients across 35 countries from all of the continents. The median age of clients in this was uh, uh, 36 years, uh, and about three quarters of the clients were men, 25% were women. Uh, median CD4 in this study was 651, and all of the patients enrolled had a CD4 count above 500. So I think this is the study that most directly speaks to the transition of our guidelines from what we said in 2013, which was treated 500 or above, or, I mean, or below, and what we're saying now, which is provide universal treatment to all. Uh, and this trial was closed early by the Data Safety Monitoring Board because of the remarkable and unexpected benefit that was seen. 
Uh, and overall, there were um, uh, uh, 42 events, in other words, either severe disease or death in the uh, immediate treatment arm compared with 96 in the deferred treatment arm over the course of follow-up. This was a highly significant difference. And I think what was important here was that there was really little evidence of any added toxicity related to the drugs between either of the arms. So no harm caused by ART, even in clients with high uh, CD4 counts. Uh, and, and, and of course, Temprano and Scott, convincing though they are, uh, are the end of a train of evidence that began over a decade ago with studies like CIPRA and SMART, uh, uh, studies like HPTN052, uh, a number of observational studies, all of which are pointing in the same direction that the earlier you start uh, ART, the more effectively you can control disease, prevent disease progression, and reduce the risk of, of transmission of HIV and acquisition of uh, opportunistic infections. So what the guidelines around when to start are going to say for adults is similar to for pregnant women, uh, that ART should be initiated in all adults with HIV regardless of clinical stage and at any CD4 cell count. And I think what this brings us to is that for the first time, we're going to see in the history of antiretroviral guidelines one recommendation that is suited for everybody and that erases the distinction between pregnant women and everybody else. Uh, uh, and, and I think this distinction for us in the PMTCT world is really one of the factors that has long contributed to relatively poor access for pregnant women, uh, for women who happen to be pregnant uh, at the time when they get diagnosed. And I think that that's a very important message from our perspective um, because it now gives us a platform uh, uh, to advocate from um, in order to potentially remove that, uh, that barrier to access for pregnant women. And what's very important is that this recommendation is heavily supported by the community. Uh, WHO undertook a community-led global consultation which involved uh, a number of different organizations, uh, a bunch of workshops in uh, eight countries, uh, looking overall at more than 200 people living with HIV and over 70 clinicians. And the overwhelming message was that early treatment was deemed uh, highly acceptable. However, the decisions should never be coerced, but rather be co collaborative, uh, and that it it's going to be important to gather comprehensive and accurate information as we roll out these uh, guidelines in order to inform decision making and help to understand really what constitutes readiness for uh, antiretroviral treatment initiation. Um, now, of course, there were some slides that looked at the specific, uh, uh, the, there was some data that looked specifically at um, uh, pregnant women, and although uh, there were no studies that compared B with B plus directly, uh, we did undertake a literature review to look at the effects of stopping antiretroviral treatment in uh, postpartum women. Um, and, and we found overall about 26 uh, largely observational studies which describe what happens when antiretroviral treatment is stopped. Uh, there's a lot of information on this slide, but what I want you to focus on is that uh, overall, all of these data show that when your CD4 count is less than 500, you have a, a between 6 to 20 percent chance of progressing to reach a treatment threshold within about six months of stopping. If your CD4 count is above 500, then that chance of reaching a treatment threshold was considerably lower at between 1 and 5 percent. In addition to immune depletion, we also saw evidence of disease progression. Uh, again, when discontinuation was um, uh, uh, in patients with CD4 less than 500 at baseline, there was a two and a half gra uh, times greater risk of stage two or three clinical events in the wake of stopping ART. Uh, and the other important finding is that retention 
was seen to be better in women that had, uh, were, were, were started on treatment simply because the system is designed to follow people on treatment, whereas people who are taken off treatment are in general told to follow up less frequently uh, or to come back when they develop new clinical signs or indications. So in, 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 in Malawi, in the pre-B plus era, uh, uh, the risk of osteoporosis is higher than after B plus is reduced. And this finding is not restricted just to developing uh, countries. It's also seen to be developed in the Yeah. You're, you're breaking up a bit. Kindly put your phones on mute, your microphone on mute if you're not speaking. Okay, great. I think, yeah, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, in any case, uh, the take-home message here is that although there were no studies that actually compared B and B+, we found evidence in the literature that there was a potential risk of harm from stopping ART in a woman who had been started under an option B, plus, uh, B program. So, if we summarize this, it's inevitable that disease will progress if you stop treatment postpartum, and we see that in, in terms of clinical events, CD4 decline, as well as a, a, a increased inflammatory markers. <coughs> what's not clear is how quickly that progression takes place. And also, what does seem to be the case is that retention for non-eligible women prior to the rollout of B+, uh, even in developed countries, seems to be relatively poor. So it's hard for the system to catch patients uh, uh, who are pre-ART before they progress to more advanced disease. Uh, and a treat-all approach might potentially improve this loss to follow-up. But there are clearly some downsides to treat-all. Uh, it will cost more in the short term but it's cost effective compared with option B in the long term. And a number of, st of studies uh, that have modeled cost effectiveness analysis comparing option B and option B plus have shown that both are highly cost effective compared to option A. And when you look at outcomes such as prolonged improvements in maternal health, uh, preventing future transmission from a mother to child in future pregnancies, and preventing horizontal transmission, option B plus has been found to be cost effective when compared with option B. So here is a number of, uh, 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 of these studies summarized on one slide. There's a lot of information here, and I would encourage those of you who are specifically interested in looking at the cost effectiveness issue to dig deeper into these studies. We've got them much better described in the full guideline document and fully referenced, of course. What you can see, though, is that in many cases, option B plus either costs the same or actually costs less per infection averted than option B. So overall, our feeling and the feeling of the guideline group was that the balance of risks and benefits favors universal ART for pregnant and breastfeeding women. There is some potential harm. There's potential risk of toxicity. There's potential risk of resistance, especially if women stop ART uh, in the postpartum period or are poorly compliant. There's obviously increased risk of, of, of uh, uh, I mean, increased cost, especially in the short term. Uh, and it may well be true that there is an increased risk of loss to follow-up if we don't get the transition right from MCH to longer-term ART uh, uh, services. But overall, the, the group felt that the benefits outweighed the risks in favor of recommending universal ART for pregnant women. And of course, most countries have already adopted this as a guideline recommendation. Uh, when we did a survey of uh, 144 uh, countries, lower middle income countries, uh, and asked about their policy adoption status, 
um, 80 percent, actually just over 80 percent, had already adopted option B plus in terms of their national recommendations. And we're beginning to see evidence of this. This is data that uh, uh, will uh, soon be available as part of the global plan report. Um, and it shows that overall, uh, what we're seeing is that among the 21 global plan countries, the number of new infections of children have now fallen between 200,000. Uh, and that ART access for pregnant women has really increased dramatically with the wide-scale adoption and implementation of B+. You can see on the orange curve, uh, pediatric ART coverage still inching upwards very gradually, but coverage for pregnant women has really skyrocketed. And I think this is a very important take-home message of one of the impacts of option B+. Uh, compared to other treatment approaches to uh, prevention of transmission. Of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity between countries in terms of coverage, so by no means is the job done. Uh, and we're seeing this in the uh, uh, percentage reduction and in new infections in children, uh, a wide variety in countries of how effectively they've been able to reduce the proportion of new infections and in the red columns, uh, the proportion of children with uh, uh, new infections that are coming from each of the 21 countries. You can see um, a significant disparity there between Nigeria, for example, uh, and uh, the rest of the countries of the continent, where something like a third of all new cases are now um, uh, originating from Nigeria. So it's clear that we still have a long way to go. Um, but I think that the policy shift to universal ART for pregnant women is a very important way of potentially uh, uh, improving our global performance. But I want to stress that I don't think it's the magic bullet that we need to control mother-to-child transmission. And let me illustrate that with this beautiful old slide, which I've adapted here from Pierre Barker. And what it, what it underscores is that even if a, a new recommendation is very effective, and in this example, what I've modeled here is a, a, a transmission rate of only 5% if a mother stays within the PMTCT program because of, a, of an efficacious PMTCT recommendation. If you have high rates of loss to follow-up and are losing women at each stage of the cascade so that fewer and fewer women are actually staying on the PMTCT pathway, then you will see overall a very large number of new infections in children, even though the ones that are actually within the PMTCT pathway have very low transmission rates and contribute very few children to that overall total. By contrast, if you have a, uh, uh, an effective um, PMTCT cascade, then even a very poor intervention, and here I've modeled another intervention that has a 10% transmission rate, even a poor intervention will give you overall a small number of, uh, of infected infants in the country because the majority of women stay within the PMTCT program. So I think this is an important learning point for us and that we should recommend countries adopt universal ART for pregnant women and breastfeeding women. This is good for the mother, it's good for the baby, it's good for serodiscordant couples, but the impact of this policy shift is contingent upon effective program performance. And a health system that's weak will need to improve coverage and retention in order to get the most bang for buck from a universal ART uh, policy. What's also clear is that some new areas for implementation focus are emerging. So in terms of our work as an IATT for PMTCT, there's clearly more that we need to do on understanding the impact of, for example, same-day start. Is it a good thing? Is it potentially a bad thing? Does it put too much pressure on the pregnant woman? And does it potentially lead to a high rate of drop-off after the initial HIV-positive test result? It's clearly important to retest women before ART is initiated to ensure that no one 
with a false positive HIV test is started on lifelong treatment. And it's, it's very important to address the issue of postpartum retention with a mix of effective uh, messaging to women that they need to remain on lifelong treatment as well as aggressive support of women during the postpartum period and as women are transitioning from MCH clinics into ART clinics, uh, those are the points where we're losing women. So these are emerging issues that I think for us mean that our work is not yet done and we still need to focus on really how we're going to adopt and really implement these universal treatment guidelines. I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you very much and um, we'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Shafiq, for a crystal clear presentation and for grounding uh, the guidelines in, um, in the reality of programs and for presenting new emerging issues that we will need to explore as a global community. We have a, a packed webinar, so without any further ado, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Martina Penazato and Dr. Eleanor uh, Namasoki Mugongo, who will present a joint uh, a joint presentation that focuses on when to start ART in children and adolescents and discusses a very concrete example and early lessons learned from Uganda. Over to you, Martina. Thank you, Jessica, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in the next, um, in the next um, 20 minutes or so, I will take you through some of the key background thoughts that led the Guidelines Development Group to revise the recommendation in terms of when to start ART for children and adolescents. And as Jessica mentioned, I will ask our colleagues in Uganda to share their direct experience to, that has directly informed this process. So I think that uh, it's important to flag as a way of a background that obviously uh, scale up of ART for children and adolescents has been lagging behind the one in adults. And we know that only 50% of HIV exposed infants uh, receive a virological test by their first two months of age, resulting in a delay in um, identification of children that are infected with HIV and uh, resulting in a, a treatment initiation which happens still when um, children are severely immunocompromised. We know that overall the retention that's being reported has been seen as poor prior to ART initiation. And then we know that in many countries access to CD4 is still limited. It's been reported up to 50% in several high burden countries. We know that there is limited existing evidence to inform treatment initiation criteria uh, revision for children and adolescents, but we know that simplification of treatment initiation criteria have been identified as critical enablers to scale up pediatric ART in countries. And this was largely the rationale that led in 2013 WHO and the Guidelines Development Group to recommend treating all children less than five years. Um, recognizing that the evidence is very strong for infants, so less than one year, and that evidence is weaker but uh, still points to a direction of uh, potential benefits and potential clinical benefits for uh, children that are older than one year. However, back then, the decision that was made was really taken on a programmatic ground, and children older than five years were recommended to start treatment with CD4 less than 500. So we know that this policy has led to a rapid scale-up of ART in some countries, at least in children less than five years, these are data from uh, Rwanda, from the Rwanda program that was the first one to really roll out the um, policy of treating all children less than five years. And they really um, shared with us some of their positive experience with this, uh, recognizing also uh, fairly good retention rates that were um, uh, observed throughout um, the past two or three years. Um, I think that the Guidelines Development Group at this point really um, identify the need to, um, to consider uh, whether treating all children and adolescents um, above 500 CD4 was the way to go. And I think that by doing so, um, the group recognized the mortality pattern, the disease progression that is observed in children older than five years and in, and in adolescents is largely similar to the ones that is observed in adults. However, there is increasing evidence that ART can positively 
impact non-ACE mobility, which includes um, delaying growth and growth development. Um, we know that um, countries have largely adopted uh, the 2013 guidelines. Um, Meg referred to that earlier. There's about 70% of African of countries in the African region that adopted treated all children less than five years. And uh, for those that are older than five years, the limited access to CD4 and the poor WHO clinical staging has clearly been recognized as a, an issue, a barrier that prevents treatment initiation in these children and adolescents. As a result, some countries have made an attempt to simplify their programs, and countries including Uganda, Zambia, Ethiopia, and Kenya have made a move to um, treating all um, children and adolescents less than 15 years on a programmatic ground. So that's what's being considered by the Gardens Development Group. And the pieces of information that were considered obviously uh, included the systematic review of direct evidence comparing deferring treatment versus immediate treatment, and then looking at observational data, including modeling exercises that use observational data sets, but particularly emphasize the value of programmatic data that came from the Ugandan program that we will hear more about later. So in terms of evidence, um, a systematic review, unfortunately, didn't really add any uh, piece of information compared to 2013. We know that the only trial that assessed directly the question on when to start ART is still the PREDICT trial, uh, which is where um, information are coming from. And this trial really didn't show any significant difference in critical outcomes that were explored back then, but did point it towards um, a clinical benefit in terms of growth and neurodevelopment that um, needed then to be confirmed. Um, I think that it's important to flag the, that the treatment initiation criteria that were considered in this trial were not necessarily uh, matching the one that WHO was considering for this current revision, and that largely uh, it, uh, this trial was conducted with children less than 10 years, so adolescents were really not represented in this set of data. And I think overall, uh, it's important to, to really recognize how the quality of evidence that informed this specific question, both for children and adolescents, was ranked as low. Uh, we then explored an updated analysis that we had conducted in 2013 um, with the collaboration of the IDEA network, uh, who updated their analysis by including a larger data set that included data from West Africa, South Africa, and from some European cohorts with the goal of really looking at um, assessing two outcomes, one, the community view mortality, and the second, growth, um, and compare these outcomes um, with the two strategies, starting treatment immediately or waiting until CD4 at less than 500. And it particularly focused on children 5 to 16 of age, uh, with the intention of having a focus on vertically infected adolescents rather than behaviorally or horizontally infected adolescents. As you can see in the red box, the data set was very large, particularly for children 5 to 10 years. There were about uh, more than 7,000 children included in, the, in this data set, and a smaller data set for adolescents, however, is still considerable, as you can see. So these analysis initially assessed uh, focus on children. So if you just look at children age 5 to 10, you can see that um, mortality can differ depending on uh, treatment initiation criteria. You can see that um, the red curve, which um, indicates immediate ART, uh, shows a cumulative mortality which is lower compared to the black curve, which is um, the one corresponding to treating all children with CD4 less than 500. And you can see from the numbers below that the difference is um, it's not that big, but however, it's significant. And that's something that uh, was recognized by the group. Uh, when looking at growth, you can see that children that uh, started treatment immediately um, compared to children that started treatment only when CD4 was below 500 had better growth parameters. And again, you can see the difference between the red curve and the black curve. And this difference was more prominent and, and statistically significant once again. But when we then looked at the age group between 10 to 15, you can see that the differences 
becomes very become very very smaller become smaller and uh, in particular you can see that the red curve and the black curve are are close to each other and that the confidence intervals that you can see with regards to the difference in terms of community mortality is very wide suggesting that the amount of data that were actually included in the data set that referred to CD4 above 500 were actually fairly um, limited. And the same was observed for growth. So once again, there wasn't really a major difference between the two uh, growth curves that you see, the red and the black ones. And once again, the confidence intervals being fairly large. So in conclusion, this uh, analysis, which uh, was, was very sophisticated and had really the goal to, um, to um, to simulate a randomized control trial comparing immediate ART versus treating uh, children with CD4 less than 500, showed that for age 5 to 10, there was better growth response with earlier ART initiation and possible mortality benefit, uh, particularly for those that had CD4 above 500. The same conclusion could not be drawn for age 10 to 16 because Differences were not so clear, and also this was a smaller sample size that, as I mentioned earlier, led to wider confidence intervals. I think at this point, the guidelines development group felt that it was important also to consider some of the direct, indirect body of evidence that is um, increasing. And um, in particular, um, the group looked at, at these um, analyses uh, done out of the uh, ARROW trial data set, uh, again, more than a 1,000 um, children, including this trial, enrolled in Uganda and Zimbabwe. And these analyses basically show that if you start treatment earlier, you're much more likely to, um, to, um, to normalize CD4 count later in life. And if you start after 10 years, you are unlikely to normalize them. Um, so um, earlier treatment initiation associated with uh, a better uh, neurological response um, overall. Uh, we also saw um, an impact on uh, growth. And again, using the ARO trial, you can see that uh, from these analysis, starting treatment earlier, it was associated to the higher likelihood of normalizing growth parameters. And we know that uh, it's well recognized how the, ne the negative impact of HIV infection in neurodevelopment and, in contrast, the positive impact of ART initiation in improving neurodevelopment outcomes. Um, so earlier entry initiation and longer duration on ART are uh, expected to have a positive impact on neurodevelopment and um, in these outcomes. I think overall, the group um, really felt that the benefits outweighed the harms. And I think it's important to, um, in the interest of time, I won't be able to go into the details of all of this. But I think it's important to recognize how earlier ART was really expected to prevent premature death and loss to follow up, enable better immune reconstitution, preventing growth and puberty delay, improving neurocognitive outcomes, improve potentially um, school performance and that's been um, uh, suggested by a number of different uh, experiences in countries and potentially avoid future burden to healthcare system with the complications that are resulting from untreating HIV related um, morbidities. The group, however, really recognized the importance of uh, addressing some of the potential risks and those include selection of HIV drug resistance that doesn't just um, uh, doesn't just result uh, from um, poor adherence, which is, for example, typical of adolescents, but it results also from a um, supply chain that is not necessarily reliable. And we know that this was a point that was very much emphasized that we need to probably go back later on when considering implementation uh, considerations attached to uh, this policy change. The group also recognized that the starting ART um, can lead to short and long-term toxicity, which can have an impact in the quality of life, and that's been described uh, through a number of consultations, um, particularly in the adolescent population, which is struggling uh, with um, some of the toxicity, uh, CNS toxicity associated with efavirenz. Um, but in general, we know that some of the adverse events are uh, probably not too um, concerning, but uh, 
are part of the um, everyday um, management of ART uh, for um, parents and caretakers. Uh, we also consider the burden on uh, programs and the potential risks that these may have when, um, when uh, a rapid scale-up of ART uh, can really uh, put too much pressure in a short time frame, not just to um, the ART clinics, but also to the entire lab and health system. So these were things that were considered by the group. Um, in terms of the resources that are expected to be available uh, and to be needed in order to um, allow this policy shift, I think it's important to uh, flag this piece of work that many of you may be familiar with that was developed um, over the past two years and that particularly focus on Zambia and explore the implications and the resource use uh, when um, considering moving to a policy where all children and adolescents less than 15 years are um, being started on treatment. And I would really recommend uh, people on, on the webinar to go back to that document and potentially consider it for their own in-country assessment as, as countries consider um, their um, this policy change. Um, I want to um, spend a few minutes on the acceptability because I think this is something that was was very much considered during the guidelines development. And um, as Shafiq mentioned, uh, WHO commissioned a fairly large um, community consultation that had a number of different workshops undertaken in different countries. And, and it's clear from the outcome of that consultation that parents and caregivers are struggling to adhere to treatment over long term and that sometimes feel like there is a sufficient uh, numbers of trained staff uh, available in the facilities that they're accessing care from, and also feeling uncomfortable and unable to deal with side effects and in need of psychosocial support um, to deal with all of this. And I think that this really flags some of the programmatic elements that, that may need to be considered alongside uh, this policy change um, as we move forward. And that's even more so for adolescents. We know um, this population is a population that um, feels being left out of decisions, and that's a significant barrier to um, adherence, for example, and that's been clearly outlined um, from by some of the workshops that were undertaken. And really the need to develop a supportive and sensitive um, environment by health providers and the need to have peer support as a potential strategy to really um, enable them to, to be more adherent to retaining care. Um, this is very much in line with some additional work that uh, WHO engaged with, particular work that was conducted by the Y Plus Network, um, a um, consultation and um, an analysis done by the PATA Network, and then a number of qualitative studies that were attached to larger trials like Arrow and Breather. And in all these consultations, I think there were key themes that really spoke to the um, challenges of adhering to ART for adolescents, the complicated psychosocial issues that adolescents need to deal with, and the limited opportunity for adolescents to discuss their concerns, um, often fearing um, about the reaction that clinicians may have. And really these, again, the need of ongoing effective support, which is critical for adherence. And I, again, I want to flag this as one of the critical pieces that needs to be addressed once thinking about treating all adolescents um, at any CD4 as a key element, a programmatic element that should be considered. So before I move to uh, the feasibility component, I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, invite our colleagues from Uganda, from the Ministry of Health, um, uh, to really take us through their own experience with treating all children and adolescents less than 15 years. And I uh, would like to invite Dr. Eleanor Namuzoke Magongo, um, who is currently the uh, program coordinator for pediatric HIV care and treatment at the Ministry of Health. Um, to uh, share with us some of their um, findings uh, of the rapid assessment that was conducted to inform the WHO guidelines. Um, Eleanor has 10 years of experience in pediatric HIV, and she was directly involved in the planning and the conduction of this policy change in Uganda. So, Eleanor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. 
Thank you very much, Martina. Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, we did a rapid assessment with the support uh, of WHO and I'll go straight to the objectives of the assessment. We wanted to document the decision-making process for updating the national treatment guidelines. We wanted to document the implementation process for the test and treat guidelines in Uganda and also to look at the program and patient outcomes for children living with HIV under 15 years. And these were ART coverage, new ART initiation, retention, and viral load. So the map shows the different facilities where we went to collect data for this rapid assessment. Most of them were health center force. And uh, we mainly looked at uh, facilities that had uh, access to uh, electronic uh, medical records. This is the timeline for the guidelines adaptation and rollout process. We started with different technical uh, working uh, group meetings that involved the ADPs, uh, the academia, the implementers. And once we decided that it was best for us to test and treat all children under 15 years, it was presented to the ministry and it was then adopted as a policy. We then embarked on uh, revising the guidelines coming up with a rollout plan, uh, developing training, the training package, job aids, quantifying and procuring medicines, and we had different meetings with the implementing partners. By Feb, we had the medicines in the country, and in March, we started training, and by May, we had a full scale up of the rollout uh, of this policy, and by Early this year, we had achieved a coverage of 80% in terms of disseminating the new policy. So our rationale for taking on the test and treat approach was uh, mainly to promote efficient use of resources, and I will discuss uh, this in the next slide. We also wanted to remove program barriers to ART initiation so that we can simplify uh, initiation of ART for children, and we had looked at our program data and we had uh, challenges of low access, late access to CD4 among children and delayed initiation among children eligible by CD4 alone. And from our programmatic data, we have also realized that better retention, we had better retention for children on ART compared to those uh, in pre-ART care. So for the efficient use of resources, we did uh, uh, modeling using spectrum and at that point we had uh, about 176 children uh, living with HIV in the country and according to the spectrum estimates 83 percent of these children were eligible for ART and this included uh, all the under fives and the older children who are eligible by according to the new WHO guidelines looking at CD4 and WHO clinical staging. So we then asked ourselves what it would take to tease out the 17% uh, knowing the challenges that I've just mentioned in the previous slide. So with that background, we decided that it would be best for us to test and treat all children under 15 years. And when we looked, compared the program uh, data that we collected during the uh, rapid assessment, we found out that uh, the information that we were getting was rhyming with the uh, spectrum estimates. You can see from that slide that 83% uh, of the children using the program data were still eligible for ART. This slide looks at uh, access to CD4 in the different facilities uh, where we went. And I would like to draw your attention to uh, the red box, the uh, larger box that shows uh, the percentages, the proportions of children accessing a CD4, first CD4 within three months. You can see that across the years, less than half uh, of the children, less than 50% of the children in care are able to get uh, a CD4 within the first three months of care. So uh, we realized that uh, this would really delay ART initiation. And when you look at the smaller box that uh, is showing the median time to uh, first CD4 around the time the guidelines were released, you can see that it would take about uh, six months then for a child 
uh, to have access to CD4. So looking at the program and patient outcomes, uh, our ART coverage increased from 22% uh, in 2013 to 32% in 2014. And as I speak now, we have uh, been able to increase our coverage to 42% with about 61,000 children now uh, on treatment. The yellow uh, uh, color there represents our uh, intended uh, coverage over the years. Uh, looking at the other uh, uh, outcome that we were interested in, uh, in this study, we can, you can see that 74% of the, uh, we had a 74% increase in the number of children newly initiated on ART, and you can see where the red arrow is that uh, once we rolled out the guideline, we had a rapid increase of uh, the number of children in ART, and this was uh, mainly the a big number of children, the uh, ones five years and above, who had been in pre ART care. And now that we are doing test and treat, all these children were mopped up and started in, on treatment during the rollout uh, process. Uh, this slide is also very important, and it shows that uh, decentralizing ART uh, by removing the uh, programmatic barriers has been able to increase uh, ART coverage at the lower uh, facility levels and especially the public health facilities. You can see that in the red uh, uh, box compared to 2013 where we had a 25% coverage uh, of ART in uh, health center threes where we have most of our uh, positive children. This was able to increase to 33% in 2014. So uh, testing and treating all our children has helped us not only to decentralize uh, ART to those lower facilities that are mainly managed by the lower uh, uh, cadres, but we can see that uh, the numbers have uh, also increased, uh, hence increasing access to ART among children. Uh, this slide is showing us the EID cascade. There's not been uh, so much change from 2013 uh, before and after the guidelines. Our coverage has almost uh, remained the same, but the important thing to note here that uh, much as we are, our coverage is low, the few that are identified as positive, most of them are able to uh, get started on treatment. We are doing uh, different pieces of work with different uh, uh, partners to uh, improve the EID coverage and also the ART initiation for HIV uh, positive infants, but I won't go into that today. This slide is showing us the other outcome, retention, and uh, the overall retention Ha, did not change a lot before and after uh, the rollout of the new policy, but uh, this was not uh, statistically significant, even with the disaggregation according to, to age, apart from the age group of two to four years, where we had uh, a statistical uh, significance from 84% to 73%. We are trying to look into this to understand why there is uh, this decline for this particular age group. But we are thinking that uh, similar to what some studies have shown, that uh, mothers with the, who be reluctant to have their children, their little ones started on treatment with the fear that the ARVs might cause some toxicities. But we are looking into it, and I know with time we shall have more information regarding that. In terms of uh, the facility levels, uh, again, the data was not statistically significant, but important to note is that for the general hospitals and the health center falls, uh, the retention has been poor both before and after the rollout of this new policy. Uh, for viral load, uh, the country started rolling out uh, viral load in August 2014, and this has mainly been a pilot in uh, a few districts, but you can see that most of our children 
are able to, are virologically suppressed, 84%, even though the numbers are small because they're just rolling out this uh, test in the country. But uh, still, 84% of all the children who have been able to have uh, this test are showing that they are virologically suppressed. So what were our positive experiences? We have seen an increased pediatric coverage by removing the eligibility criteria. We have uh, seen more children at the public health facilities accessing ART. We had a very successful training approach that was site-based focusing on uh, training health workers, the actual implementers, and also giving us an opportunity to coach at the same time as we train, and uh, focusing on using the job aids. We were able to train a bigger number of health workers as compared to the workshop uh, kind of training or setting, and we were able to achieve a first country-wide uh, rollout of the guidelines. So this is to show you some of the materials that we developed for uh, training the health workers and disseminating this policy. That was the facilitator's guide. Because we are doing facility-based trainings, most of our facilities do not have access to uh, electricity, so we had to come up with uh, an innovative trainer's flip chart that was big, and that's what we used at, at the facilities. This is a desk uh, flip chart that has the consolidated guidelines, both the changes and uh, the new things that came up with the release of the guidelines, but also the things that stayed the same from the previous uh, guidelines. This is our ART dosing chart. Previously, we had one for only children. This time around, we integrated the children and uh, adult uh, drugs and we also included uh, TB drugs and INH prophylaxis so that health workers are able to have just one dosing chart for all the drugs in the HIV clinic. Uh, this is a brochure that we had to come up so that uh, our health workers uh, sometimes have a habit of moving away with the training materials, the job aids, so we had to be very creative and come up with a brochure so that we discourage them from moving away with the consolidated guidelines. So this has a summary of uh, all the key changes and the new uh, uh, things that came up with the new guidelines. We had some challenges, and as already mentioned, uh, one of them was low retention. We've come, currently come up with uh, a task uh, team to look at uh, retention and what package we can come up with to disseminate to all facilities to be able to improve retention. We had challenges with commodities. Of course, the cost uh, went up with the test and treat. You can see from uh, uh, 26 to 32 million, we were not able to uh, hit our target of 28,000, but at least we were able to have 20,000 children started on treatment. We had uh, global challenges, uh, global stockouts of Abacaville, 3 tc but uh, most of our facilities were stocked with ARVs apart from 10% of the public health facilities. We've been having uh, challenges with the pediatric uh, ARVs are uh, potential stockouts, but we've had, we are having discussions with PEPFAR and also Global Fund, and we know that this will be resolved. So what are the key messages? Removing eligibility criteria has operationalized decentralization of pediatric ART at public health settings and improved ART access to children in rural areas. But we must think carefully for countries that are going to do the same. We must think carefully about uh, funding for the commodities, uh, the training, and how to deliver the medicines from the warehouses to the facilities that offer ART. And then again, uh, plans uh, for strategies to retain children and adolescents in care are very critical. And uh, very important also is HCT must remain as a point of focus, knowing that it is the initial point into entry point into care. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eleanor. So I will be very quick in wrapping up this part of the webinar and going back to my presentation with the last few slides. Um, 
So um, in terms of feasibility, I think that the example shared from Uganda really highlights how this is all possible. But um, even with the best planning, there are challenges that need to be considered. And some of those are obviously include uh, potential for stockhouse, the need for strengthening laboratory um, uh, network, and also the need really to fully support healthcare workers that are going to be involved in all of this. I think when it comes to implementation, it will be really important to ensure that retention and all the support to adherence is put in place alongside the scale up of ART for all children and adolescents, and particularly for adolescents for which we know um, adolescent friendly services are a key element that should be put in place to address, to fully address the specific needs of this age group. Um, I also want to emphasize that while um, CD4 is not um, a condition to start treatment anymore, based on CD4 will still be very important in the clinical assessment at the very beginning and remain a critical tool together with clinical monitoring wherever viral load monitoring is not available. So that should be considered as well. I put in my presentation that you will then see from the slide a couple of summary slides the evidence that I, have, that I have mentioned earlier and some of the programmatic rationale that uh, Eleanor has um, touched upon, so really the possibility of eliminating uh, the need for CD4, um, avoiding the delay of ART initiation, simplifying overall the program um, that may um, facilitate further decentralization and task shifting. Um, I just want to uh, finish by really um, uh, showing uh, to everyone what the final recommendations are and flagging that for the first time we do have separate recommendations for adolescents and for children, even though they have similar quality of evidence and the strength of the recommendation. And the reason being that uh, the group really felt that uh, adolescents is a particular group that needs to be uh, addressed. And uh, it's a group for which evidence is lacking, both from the pediatric as well as the adult uh, research. Um, uh, we know that there is really a data gap in that specific age group that needs to be filled. But also, it's a population that requires specific support uh, to ensure that adherence and retentions are um, good. Um, so I think it's important to flag that the conditionality of Though these recommendations is by no means a way to soften the message that all children and adolescents should be started on treatment, but is rather a way to flag some of the specific programmatic elements that will have to be put in place in order to safely start ART in, in these specific populations. And I finally wanted to flag that even though all children and adolescents should be started on treatment, uh, WHO also provide a prioritization in this table that you can see um, for those children and adolescents that are more likely to progress and dying. And uh, that's been identified by the CD4 uh, count of 350 for adolescents and a clinical stage of three and four. And um, for children, um, as you are all familiar, um, the thresholds are slightly different, but um, in line with what was proposed in 2013. So nothing new on that front. And again, treating all infants, it, it remains a strong recommendation. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be available for any question. Thank you so much, uh, Martina and uh, Dr. Eleanor McGongo from uh, Uganda for really laying out uh, the potential uh, benefits of starting ART earlier in children and adolescents and discussing uh, what has been uh, achieved in Uganda in terms of improvements in access and ART initiation as well as outlining the challenges. We've had a few questions already and we'll take one to two more just for the sake of time since uh, we still have a, a presentation that will focus on pre-exposure prophylaxis and its implications for EMTCT. Um, a couple of questions have already been posed and I'll group them together and ask them as, as a batch. So one question was around any changes in ART guidelines for HIV-exposed infants, as well as any changes in testing for HIV-exposed infants, especially in regards to the implementation of option B plus and continuing 
breastfeeding in resource limited settings. So Shafiq and Martina, if you'd like to respond to that question. Hello? Shafiq, do you want to start with infants, exposed infants? Yes, I'm sorry. I was uh, un, un, uh, uh, I had forgotten to unmute myself. Uh, there will certainly be new guidance on uh, what to do about exposed infants. Um, uh, uh, you know, obviously those recommendations are still being finalized, so we don't know precisely what the story will be. Um, but I think in, in, you know, in reflecting the fact that we're now moving to universal treatment for all, the new guidance will say, uh, you know, assuming that when a, uh, a case of HIV is identified late in either the mother or the baby, um, can you initiate treatment in the mother immediately uh, so that we begin to get maternal viral load down as soon as possible? And then what can you do with her newborn in order to minimize the risk of transmission. So I think what we're going to see is more aggressive approaches to prophylaxis in those clinical settings. Martina, anything to add? Yeah, maybe I can add that also obviously the testing component has been re-looked at and um, that will be shared in the full uh, document of the guidelines that will be launched in December. Um, and obviously, um, potential different timing for uh, the first test to be conducted was considered by the group, and so um, some direction will be provided on that. Um, yeah, that's it. And there was a question in regards to, Martina, your, your comment around specific countries such as Kenya and Ethiopia providing treatment to children earlier on programmatic grounds. Can you explain what programmatic grounds mean? I think, um, I think countries really perceive the treating all less than five uh, as a simplification for their program. And um, some countries um, did a similar exercise as Uganda in looking at how many children would then be spared by ART if we had to apply the five age cutoff. And it came up that only 20% um, were left out, were not in need of ART. And, and that didn't seem a, um, didn't necessarily make sense to some of these programs. And so, um, these programs moved into a further simplification and decided to treat all infants, uh, children and adolescents less than 15 years. So my understanding is that is, that has been largely the reason to, um, for that early move before the guidelines uh, came out. Okay, thank you. And we've received a couple more questions. I'll ask uh, Shafiq and Martina if you can present uh, if you can respond, excuse me, uh, via writing uh, uh, in the chat section sure. of the webinar. Uh, that way we can move forward with our last um, presentation by Dr. Dominica Sidman of the University of California in San Francisco, who is an OBGYN and has focused her research on integrating pre-exposure prophylaxis into family planning care. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Seidman, uh, to discuss the guidelines and its implications uh, for EMTCT. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. I'm pleased to discuss with you this morning or this afternoon for some of you the WHO's early release guidelines on pre-exposure prophylaxis for prevention of HIV and implica implications for elimination of mother-to-child transmission. We're going to go through briefly, um, since we're a little bit limited by time, the evidence behind the WHO's guidelines on pre-exposure prophylaxis with special attention to women and specifically women during pregnancy and breastfeeding. The WHO carefully worded their recommendation for pre-exposure prophylaxis, stating that oral PrEP containing tenofovir should be offered as an additional prevention choice for people at substantial risk of HIV as part of a combination of prevention approaches. 
the key point here is that PrEP should be offered, never required or even recommended to people at substantial risk of HIV. We're going to go into the concept of substantial risk in a few slides, but the idea that PrEP is a choice cannot be overestimated, overemphasized. Not only to respect patient autonomy, but also because the qualitative data suggests that adherence and therefore efficacy improves when individuals specifically choose PrEP. As we heard from Dr. Doherty, the WHO conducted a systematic review with the following inclusion criteria. And their results were as follows. The review reported a total of 12 trials, 10 of which I present here, which are the of the separate risk ratio. The review found that PrEP was effective overall and was effective specifically in women as demonstrated by six trials in over 8,700 women, who, which demonstrated a statistically significant risk reduction of HIV infection of 43%, as indicated by the orange circles at the center of your screen. However, when you look at the far right column, you'll notice that the meta-regression statistics, that there was really no different difference in PrEP's efficacy based on sex, mode of acquisition, age, or drug regimen. Based on this meta-analysis, the WHO chose to rec recommend any tenofovir-containing regimen and not specifically tenofovir and tricitabine, which to date has the most data from trials. The final who were highly adherent to drug were, had significantly more protection against HIV infection, which you can see at the far top right of your slide. This is a graphical depiction of the association between adherence and efficacy. Higher adherence was associated with more protection from PrEP. Studies conducted in women at risk of sexual transmission are highlighted with the yellow stars. I added this emphasis to demonstrate specifically two high-profile studies, FemPrep and VOICE, which showed no effect, but subsequent analyses suggest opposite end of the spectrum, the Partners PrEP trial showed good adherence and a statistically significant effect in women. Partners PrEP trial was a trial of 4,700 serodiscordant couples who were randomized